So today's going to be a real college algebra day. We're going to take a slightly more advanced look at just about everything. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the rate of change in luxury purchases in a certain country country with respect to time in years. Now, anytime you see the words rate of change, that means slope. I've got to see what's happening outside. Something's happening. There's a truck out there with some kind of something on the back of it. That was real descriptive. OK, rate of change. Probably the most important part of any graph is the slope of a line between two points on that graph. And that shows you how fast X and Y are changing with respect to each other. Now, what's important, of course, is that X really means something in real life and Y means something in real life when you're doing that in real life. So you really care about how fast things are changing, whatever it is you're looking at. So here, what we're looking at is the rate at which luxury purposes, uh, pur purposes, purchases are increasing over time, with time being in years. For instance, in 2010, we see that luxury purchases in the billions, if you read alongside the y-axis, luxury purchases in billions were Ah, here we go right here, $8.4 billion. Whereas in 2017, they had risen to $27.2 billion. Now, these uh, uh, numbers are made up, okay? But anyway, if we live in this world, just decide we're going to live in this particular universe for a minute, we're looking at um, more people buying luxury goods. That would be one theory of what's happening. Also, inflation, that luxury purchases are costing even more. Whatever the cause, the fact that you've got this price lower, or yeah, you've got this amount of money lower and this amount of money higher, means that over the years, the amount of money spent on luxury purchases has gone up. Why? Well, a specialist would deal with that. Now, what we wanna do is find the average rate of change of the increase in those luxury luxury items per the increase of spending on the luxury items per year that's called the rate of change and so what we're going to do is use the slope we're going to find the slope of this line so i'm going to let this point which is 2017, comma 27.2, be X1 and Y1. And I'm going to let the 2010 numbers be X2, Y2. And I'm going to find the slope of the line in a minute. Okay. 
there. Okay, so as you recall from yesterday and certainly from your past in math, the formula for slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And now that I've decided what point's going to be x1, y1, and what point's going to be x2, y2, I really should have done it the other way, but I didn't, so I'm going to just stick with it. I'll have y2 minus y1. See, this is going to give me negative numbers on top and on the bottom, but it'll all work out in the end. 2010 minus 2017. Whoop. And so what that will do is give us 8.4 minus 27.2. Okay, over 2010 minus 2017, that would be negative seven, but let's do it officially anyway. 2010 minus 2017, negative seven, that'll be negative 18.8, over negative seven. And let's look and see what they want for an answer. The rate of change is about 2.69 billion per year. Type an integer or a decimal rounded to two decimal places as needed. Okay, now I know. So I'm going to take negative 18.8 and divide it by negative seven of course, the negatives cancel out. And I am left with this number right here. So let me move that over here, just so the figures will be there when you look at the notes. Okay, and here we go. Now I have to round to two decimal places. So here are my first two decimal places, one and two. I look over at three and three will tell me whether or not to round the eight up to a nine. Five is big enough to round eight up to a nine. So I'll turn the eight into a nine and drop the other decimal places off. And that's how they got the answer 2.69. And that means billions. So what this says is that, well, what it should be telling you is that in this in this particular story, the uh, the rate the uh, amount of luxury purchases is going up because this is positive is going up two point sixty nine billion dollars per year. Any discussion or questions about that? See, in real life, slope is very important. In math, in the lower levels, it tends to just be which way the line is tilted and, and how steep is the line. But in real life, it tells us stuff like this. Incidentally, a fact you want to keep in the back of your mind for now, because it, it will be important. I don't know what's wrong with my voice. <clears throat> oh, whatever. 
whenever you see a graph and points on the left are lower than points on the right, that's said to be increasing, which is appropriate since um, the uh, rate of change of luxury purchases is positive, so that means it's going up. It's increasing. Okay, just keep that in mind for a while. Ah, now here we're talking about rate of change. We're talking about the value of computers in hundreds of dollars over time, number of years of use. Notice that the line is tilting down a little bit. The points on the left are higher than the points on the right. This is said to be decreasing. So you can just look at this and see that the value is decreasing. That means the slope is negative. And indeed, the number they have up here is negative. You can choose any two points on a line that you know for sure and find the slope. Well, all of these are easy to know for sure. This point is 0, 18. This point is 1, 17. This point is 2, 12, and this point is 3, uh, uh, 9, higher math. So I can use any two points I want to find the slope. Since this is a straight line, that'll be true for any other two points. So, why don't I choose the ones I'm really super certain of and let it be this point and this point so that if I let this point be x1, y1, and this point be x2, x2, y2, then what that means is that x1, y1 is going to be 0, 18. And x2, y2 is going to be 2, 12, then my slope formula is going to be m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So that, let's see, this will be, <coughs> excuse me, 12 minus 18, over 2 minus 0. So we'll have 6 over 2, which is 3. Ah, negative 6 over 2, which is negative 3. So before I answer negative 3, I better look over here and see that they did not put the word hundreds over here, which is why they answered at negative 300. So what they're saying is that the value of a computer goes down at $300 per year. 
I believe it. Again, the importance of slope. Any questions? Anyway, whenever you see the words rate of change, all that means is you're going to find the slope. Discussion. Okay. So although you see the numbers, it says value of computer in hundreds of dollars you just add. So you do the math and then you add a hundred onto it. Like turn it into a hundred. Well, well, yeah. What you're actually going to do is you multiply a hundred by it because it's that many hundreds. So negative three times a hundred would be negative three hundred. Over here, if they hadn't included the word billions, then we would have taken 2.69 and multiplied that by a billion. So it would be a thousand million. One, zero, 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 zero is a million, zero, 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 is a billion. So we could have worked that out, but that sort of gives you a headache, doesn't it? So to save us from putting on uh, numbers, just added uh, for us. Yeah, they, they added the word for us, so we didn't have to write out 2.69 billion. But over here, I guess they wanted to see if we knew that if the word 100 or the word hundreds isn't there, did we know that negative three was not the answer, but negative three hundredths or negative 300? Does that make any sense? Yes. Good. Thank you for asking. Anybody else? OK, well, we'll move on to something that you're definitely going to have questions about. Could you scroll back up for just a second. Sure. Um, trying to finish writing. Sure. Thank you. Just you for welcome. a couple moments. Okay. These, these notes will be available to you in modules in Canvas. Now, this is another way to find slope. It's a lot harder. But we have to learn it because this is typically used I just made up something. This is typically used to find the instantaneous rate of change or the marginal utility, the marginal cost, the marginal profit. Anybody who's had an economics course has heard those words. at any particular point to find the slope of a line tangent to the graph. So like for this X coordinate, I, if I could find the slope of that line, I would know how fast everything is changing at that X value or at this X value. Finding the slope of a line tells you how fast something is changing. So we're taking the, um, the easy approach here, the easier approach, by starting
starting our use of this with something that's basically very easy. OK, and then as time goes by, we're going to build up and up and up to more difficulty. This is called the difference quotient. What H is, if you're interested, H is a very, very small number. Often it's that number in the sciences. But H can be a really small number like this. Whoever, whoever is using this um, knows what their H is. H often is used to measure the error in measurements. All measurements contain an error. And error is really important because it tells you how likely an outcome is to happen. If you've got a lot of error in your measurements, uh, then you might want to think of changing your measurement tools to something more exacting. But there is no such thing as an absolutely exact measurement. There's always error. So, this is also, H is also the error in measurements. It depends on, on who is, is doing this and what their reason is. If any of you had calculus in high school, you've seen this ugly sucker right here. Well, we're going to be working with it. So, you have to be told what f of x is. You have to know that or you cannot do this. F of X, we're, we're also going to use four steps. OK, so step one. Is to write down F of X and what F of X equals, not little, but big. <clears throat> and there's a reason that you want to have more space to work with. OK, now that wasn't hard. The next one is a little scarier. Because we have to find out what F of X plus H is. I don't want to offend whoever has their mic on, but I'm going to mute you, OK? But I in no, in no way mean to be putting anybody down. OK. Eight times, yeah, eight times X plus H. This is the code that says, OK, for every X up here in F of X, stick in X plus H. So we'll have eight times X plus H minus nine. Well, I mean, I'm going to multiply eight times X and eight times H. So I will have eight X plus eight H minus nine, because the minus nine is at the end. Now I know what F of X plus H is. Now step three is going to be F of X plus H minus F of X. All right, I know what f of x plus h is. And I'm going to subtract the original f of x. So 
Is that right? 8x minus 9, yes. Okay, so I'll have 8x plus 8h minus 9, and then I'm going to distribute the minus sign to 8x and to minus 9. It's just like distributing a negative 1. Negative times positive 8x is minus 8x, and a minus sign, which is negative, times negative is positive or a plus sign. Now I'm going to combine my like terms, which you'll always do for step three. Okay, so I'll have 8x minus 8x. Gosh, they're going to disappear. Goodbye. And I'm going to have minus 9 plus 9. They're going to disappear. They don't disappear, they turn into zeros. So all I'm left with is 8h. So now I know what f of x plus h minus f of x is. So step four, is going to be f of x plus h minus f of x over h, which is the difference quotient. But it's just a way of finding the average rate of change or the instantaneous rate of change, but our goal in life was to find the average rate of change. We know that f of x plus h minus f of x gives us 8h. And then we divide by h. And that leaves us with just 8. Now, so what? Our rate of change is 8. But the thing is, you would have known that just by looking at this. F of x equals 8x plus 9 is really y equals 8x minus 9 not plus 9, minus 9, <clears throat> and the slope is 8. You already know that. When you've got y equals all by itself, then the number in front of the x is the slope. And the slope is the rate of change. So when you're using the difference quotient on a straight line, The answer is just the slope. But we're going to do it again. And again, the answer is going to be negative 6 because this is nothing more than a straight line. This is y equals negative 6x plus 3. The slope is negative 6, and this ugly critter right here is really just a slope. So why bother? Because we're going to be doing this with some things like f of x equals x to the third plus 3x squared minus 2x minus 7. And that becomes a lot harder. So you have to know how to do, do the difference quotient with easy things before you learn how to do them with hard things.
that is how to find the difference quotient with something that's more difficult. Okay, so we're gonna do this one more time to get you familiar with the steps. That's my only goal here, is to get you familiar with the difference quotient while we're talking about straight lines. So step one. f of x equals negative 6x, writing real big, plus 3. Step 2, f of x plus h is negative 6 times x plus h plus 3. So negative 6 times x is negative 6x, and negative 6 times plus h is minus 6h. And then here's the plus 3. So that's what f of x plus h equals. Step three. If you do this in order. Ma'am. Yes. Where are we getting the three? Uh, I'm kind of confused. Wasn't it there to begin with? Yes, there's the plus three right there. Oh, okay, sorry, I was... No, no, no problem, no problem at all. It's easy to lose track of these things. Okay, now we're going to calculate F of X plus H minus F of X. So F of X plus H is this, Slightly ugly thing right here. Negative 6x minus 6h plus 3. And the original f of x was negative 6x plus 3. Which means we're going to have negative 6 x minus 6 h plus 3. Now, this is the tricky part, which is why you need to make sure you always put parentheses around uh, something you're subtracting. Because you have to distribute that minus sign into every term here, and it's so easy to make a sign error. Negative times negative 6x is positive 6x, or plus 6x. And negative, or minus, times plus 3 is minus 3. So then does it cancel out the 6x and the 3? Yeah. Negative 6x, this one, negative 6x plus 6x equals 0. And 3 minus 3 is 0. So I'm left with negative 6h. So now I know that f of x, f of x plus h minus f of x is negative 6h. So now I can go on to step four. The difference quotient is f of x plus h 
minus f of x over h. I know what the top is, the numerator, f of x plus h minus f of x, I just calculated is negative 6x. When I put it over h, the h's cancel out, leaving me with negative 6, which is the slope of the line. Which is what you'd expect for a straight line. If you're going to, well, I was going to say, if you're going to take a math class after this, don't forget the four step process. It cuts down on errors. But in this class, remember the four step process. It cuts down on errors. Trying to do everything in one step will drive you crazy especially with something that's more complicated than this. So the important things you want to take away from it today are f of x plus h minus f of x over h is just another form of slope. And that you want to use a four-step process with it. Okay. Uh, what do we call this? You said sl uh, slope intercept form. Is that what it is? No, it's it's well. This is in slope intercept form, but this is called the difference. Quotient. A quotient is the answer to something that's divided, and this is divided, top divided by bottom. Difference means subtraction, and that's how it how it got its name. One of the many things in this class, I was going to say that you have to, to memorize, but actually uh, you don't have to memorize it exactly because it'll always be given to you, but you need to know what to do with it. Any more discussion or questions? This is the end of the torture with the, the difference quotient, I think. Yes, now comes torture with domain and range. Well, this one's pretty easy to find. In fact, here are the answers right here, the domain and the range, but let's talk about why. I like to use different colors when I explain finding the domain and range. Is there I any way I can, we can see the, the words too, or? So we can copy the notes. Thank you. Yeah. Determine the domain and range of the given graph of a function. And then it says the domain of the graph of the function is. And it gives you that. 
And it also says write it in interval notation. This is interval notation. And then the range of the graph of the function is blah, blah, blah. Type your answer in interval notation. So I'm going to write that big because it's important. Interval. And Laura, I think that was you, wasn't it? Who asked that? Yes, ma'am. I just want to make sure that like I get the notes down because I had trouble before and I just want to make sure I don't have the same trouble again. Right. I understand. I wanted to thank you for feeling free to talk to me and tell me what you need. Other people have that freedom too. I am pretty easy to get along with. OK. Enough for self advertising. Let's let's get on with this and talk about why. Why? Why the domain is what they say it is and why the range is what they say it is. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to write it bigger beside the graph and then we're going to talk about why. Bracket negative seven comma six bracket. Why the brackets? We're going to talk about that. Bracket negative three comma four bracket. Okay, here we go. Here's our first graph. And here's another piece of information that will become important to you next week or the week after. This is pieces of different graphs that are being stuck together. There's a name for a graph like this. It's a doozy. Here, I'm going to write the name going to go up here and write the name and then come back down. Piecewise. Dash defined. So if we had written these out, we would have one, two, three different functions. And how you most often see that written is f of x equals, and then you see this brace, and then you have uh, the first equation, I'm just gonna say first equation, first eq second EQ, and third EQ. There you go. Hello, George. Oh, EG. You see, he's getting me all upset here. Get off my desk, please. This is the joy of working from home. Isn't it great? I do understand when people say they have kids and the kids want to help them learn. Yeah. What can you do? Need to get a cat sitter? I'm sorry, what? He must be telling you it's no longer a math class. It's cat 101. That's it. Cat 101. All right. How, how about that? You're more fun to 
study. Yeah. All right, but now getting back to serious things. These have been put together in one graph. One function. We're going to find the domain and the range in interval notation. Well, OK. The area of. The X axis, the part of the X axis that travels along with the graph that that matches up with the graph. Let's see, the graph starts here. And then it goes. Here, I have a better idea. Starts here. And goes here. That is the part of the X axis that matches up with the graph. The green line is the domain. We always start on the left and go to the right. So this line is, I mean, this point on the x-axis, I assume is negative seven, but let's count it out. Negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six, negative seven, yes. And it goes all the way to positive six. Now something that's very important. Notice that these dots, these circles are solid. Now let me compare these to these. Those points are said to be open. They're open holes. These are solid. When you see a solid beginning and a solid end, that's when you use brackets. That means that at this point, X actually equals negative seven. And at this point, X actually equals six. Brackets tell us that. Now this is where the line starts. There's a comma, and this is where the line ends. And so in math, that tells us a whole story. The function has the domain that starts at X equals negative seven and includes every little number between negative seven and positive six and includes positive six. And all of that can be said with this symbol right there. This is called an interval, an interval of numbers on the X axis. Okay, now the range is the same kind of deal but it's on the Y axis. So I'm going to use a different color. I'm going to use blue. And for range, we always go from lowest to highest. Now that's bad English because there are only two numbers. So I should be using the comparative case, which would be lower and higher, but I, I think 
using EST just communicates better what I'm saying. So I use low est, high est, and I'm glad I'm not an English major. Yes. Okay, so the very lowest point on the y-axis that matches up with the graph is right here. And the very highest point on the graph, I, I mean on the y-axis that matches up with the graph is right here. So the range of this function goes from here, the lowest point, to here, the highest point. And that's the range. Now this is negative one, negative two, negative three, just making absolutely sure. And this is one, two, three, four. So the range includes the, um, the intervals of numbers from y equals negative three to y equals positive four. Y actually equals negative three y actually equals positive four, and all the numbers between negative three and negative four, including the little bitty fractions and decimals between the whole numbers. And so that's why the brackets, and the reason it's written this way is kind of the same way you'd say it in English. Well, the range runs from negative three to positive four and all the numbers in between, but it takes fewer words. OK, so the blue line. Is the range. But there's another way to write this, as you know, and that's set builder notation. This is interval notation, so I'm going to write that. Now we're going to write set builder notation and say the exact same thing that this says. Set builder notation always has braces around it, even when the holes are open. Let me go to green the domain. The domain is on the X axis, so I write the letter X. And then a vertical line. And then I write the end points which for the domain are negative seven and positive six. I write them like that because I'm going to put X in the middle. And then I make any quality signs between them. The arrows always have to point to the left. 
what this says in English is all real numbers such that X is between negative seven or the numbers on the X axis are between negative seven and positive six and X actually equals negative seven. That's what that bar is underneath the less than sign. Ne X actually equals negative seven and X actually equals positive six. Okay, now talk about the range. Is the range also the same? as the domain, but with the different numbers, so that x is negative three, but equal to x, or uh, is greater than or equal to x, then greater than or equal to set four? You've got the right idea, yes. Okay. So here the range, is going to use the letter Y because it's on the Y axis. That's a difference, but it just shows it's on different axis. And then the bar. And then that Y is between negative three, the lowest number, and positive four, the highest number. And again, I'm going to use less than or equal to and less than or equal to. But what this really says is all the real numbers such that Y is between negative three or Y equals all the numbers between negative three and positive four and Y actually equals negative three and y actually equals positive four. It's like you could almost write a whole paragraph for the meaning of this one short line. And this one short line. So instead of writing on and on and on forever, Math people invented this. The reason there are two different ways to say it is the world's a really big place and in some areas people wrote like this and in some areas people wrote like this, mathematicians. So they developed separate systems and now we're so lucky we get to learn both systems. More discussion. You'll use interval notation a lot more frequently than you use set builder, but you still got to be able to know how to play with them a little bit. This, this you'll use less than that. Let's see, did it ask us anything else? No. Now, let us move on down here. And while these are similar graphs, notice that the endpoints are not solid dots. So we kind of have a different kind of game going on here. Notice that this graph is going to keep going, 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 going. Down, 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 and to the left, 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 forever and ever. And this graph is going to go sideways to the right forever and ever and ever. Now in interval notation, this is really easy to write. 
here, if I use green to mean domain, then the entire X axis, let me do something straight here. The entire X axis is going to be the domain with negative infinity on the left and positive infinity on the right. So the domain in interval notation is that. The range, on the other hand, is a little tricky. Now first, notice that this part of the graph goes down, 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 down forever. So the part of the y-axis that, ma that matches up with the graph is going to go down, 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 down forever. Well, the y-axis has negative infinity at the bottom and positive infinity at the top. But the graph doesn't go up forever to positive infinity. It only goes as far as one, two, three on the y-axis. So let me write three somewhere. I'll do it here. Three on the y-axis right there. Exactly three. Y actually equals points that have Y coordinate three. So the way we're going to write the range Yes, it goes all the way down to negative infinity, but it only goes as far as y equals 3. Now that's interval notation. Set builder on the other hand is written differently depending on what class you're in and what book you're reading. But given how your book has called things so far, the terminology it's used. The domain is all real numbers. In other words, the entire X axis. The range, look what I didn't do. The range is going to be y 
such that. OK, set builder uses more traditional inequality symbols. So notice that all of the Y's in the range are three or below. So the range is going to be all the real numbers such that the Y's that are used are less than or equal to three. And that's our story for this. And the interval notation, since that's what the problem is actually asking for, here are the answers down here. Okay, we've talked about this before, but it's so important. We need to talk about it again. And, but we talked about it when it comes to evaluating a function. You know, you, uh, f of negative four, well, you take negative four, stick it in for every x and calculate an answer. What if you don't know what the equation is? That's where this comes in. I'm going to make this bigger. And go over here. I want to write closer to this. F of negative 4. F of negative 3. F of negative 2. OK. Now I can just scroll on over here. Maybe even, even make it a little bit bigger. There. <laughs> All right. In reality, what, what functions do is they map X coordinates to Y coordinates. And the function is shown, a picture of the function, is what a graph is. Well, here we have a graph. And this is the function f. Let me make it the same color. What it does is it takes an x-coordinate on the x-axis, negative 4, and it transports that to the y-axis, and here's how. You beam up from the x-axis, from the ground, to the Starship Enterprise, or whichever one they're, they're using, and then you are transported directly somewhere else. But it's a two step process. So beam me up, Scotty. Up you go and then you're sent over here. Well, what is that? That's three. So F of negative four is sent over to three. And that's how this works. Here's negative three. F of negative three, 
Okay, notice that the starship is moved. That's how I think of it. The starship has moved and now you're beaming up to the starship here from negative three on the X axis and then you're shot over here to the Y axis and that is seven. Looks like seven. Yeah, seven. Okay, so negative three is being sent to positive, negative three on the x-axis is being sent to positive seven on the y-axis. Transported. The thing is that's really true, only instead of calling it transported, the official math word is mapped, M-A-P-P-E-D, and this process is called mapping. It's kind of cool. All right, now, negative two on the x-axis is transported up. Up to the graph, up to the line and then transported over here to the y-axis, and that number is five on the y-axis. So, f of negative two is five, showing that if you have a graph, you don't need the equation or the function or the, or the, for, uh, um, or the formula. You don't need to have an X to stick this X into if you can see where it's being sent. And of course, what does this mean? That means that this point is where negative three, negative four, negative four, I'm sorry, negative four meets three. And where negative three meets seven and where negative two meets five. 